So our one today is Thursday, April 29th, 2021. Where the hell did April go? <laughs> I know I'm always amazed at how fast time flies. It is the week in charts. I'm sure I want to thank all you guys and girls for finding the webinar once again. I don't know why we had so many difficulties, but eventually we'll get that fixed. I might have to put somebody on it. All right, what are we going to talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions, I have a lot to say about that. Your questions on trading, if you don't mind, just some ADD doesn't kick in. Keep them focused on the slides, and then when we get to the live charts, feel free to ask about anything you want. And uh, hold off on your stock picks until we get to the live charts, and if you don't mind. That's for your benefit, just so I don't accidentally, accidentally delete one. And also ask about one at a time. So what are we talking about? Well, I'm going to talk about profit centers, and today we had a wonderful example with the leverage ogres. And I figured it'd be a great time, especially with these live examples, or live as of a few hours ago, to talk about. I want to talk about squeezing out additional profits. I've got one mediocre example. The one example where it actually didn't work, and I think it's important to show you both. And at the last minute, somebody asked me about 2XR trading, and I'll have a lot to say about that it's a money manager thing as you know you can lose money trading or as often summing up of predictions or about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then thank you greg morris for giving that to me <laughs> leaned over in a seminar once and said that all right let's talk about squeezing out additional profits on the initial profit target with the core methodology it, it's a fairly simple methodology as as many of you know and basically it's pullback in nature and we're looking to take partial profits on a swing trade and trail a stop on the remainder for free rolling, as we call it, or, or now call it, thanks to Charlie Kirk, or playing with the market's money. And I think it's a great way to trade, and I'm going to explain that in a few minutes when we go through a few examples, especially when we get the little money management section I want to talk about with the 2XR thing. Anyway, where you really sort of excel with the methodology is being able to add a little layer of discretion on top of it. I'm working with an Italian bank right now and um, God bless them. They, I love them to death, but they, they want like exacts on everything so their clients could, could go out and do exactly what I'm doing. And the reality is there's a little discretion when it comes to the entries and the stops and everything else. And then in the management of, of the position, there's a little discretion too. The good thing is all of this is very easily teachable. I might not be able to fit it into the 45 minute time slot that I have, especially with translation, but it's very teachable and we teach it, or I, te I teach it every week, obviously, and we have tons and tons of videos behind a firewall on the website. But anyway, applying a little layer of discretion on top of the layer of discretion, Okay, or let me rewind that. Applying a little bit of additional discretion, even once something is laid out, like an initial profit target and things like that, you could actually make a little bit more money. And sometimes there's a potential for, for using a little discretion to make everything pay off really big. Now, we had MUDs on the Landry list and as official recommendation about a week or so ago. And it's a pattern I call a first deep retracement. That's when an IPO comes public and has the big run up and then has its first pullback. And ideally, the pullback's kind of deep to kind of shake out a lot of people. Everybody gets excited, everybody rushes in, gets shaken out, and then the real move happens next. Not all the time, but sometimes. There's the service for 42021. By the way, Go to DaveLeonard.com slash archives. And when I do the editing of this video, I know you're probably thinking, does he edit these videos? <laughs> I do, believe it or not. You'll see, I'll update those archives. So this one will be in there from 420. And you can see that it had an entry of 13 and 30. The next number is the stop. And the next number is the initial profit target. In that risk to reward, which we'll talk quite a bit about in a few minutes, thanks to one of you guys' last minute request is $2.30 because that's what it called for. There's no exact science to that, but with a little common sense, it's pretty easy to figure it out. In this case, the stock closed fairly poorly and certainly a long ways away from the high. So I figured an entry not too far away from the high, plus a little wiggle room, 
would be a good place to put an entry. And in this particular case, stops down here, really not that far below the low. So it's almost kind of textbook in nature. Stop plus a little wiggle room, I'm, I'm sorry, high plus a little wiggle room for the entry, stop plus a little wiggle room for the stop, okay? Low plus a little wiggle room for the stop. So above the high, above the low, okay? Respectively, entry and stop. And the reason that stop is where it is is because if it goes much further than that, and that's the beauty of a pattern such as the first deep retracement, and maybe this does lend itself well to uh, the conversation we're going to have here in a few minutes about R. And I'm kind of, I, I hope no pirates are listening, but I'm a kind of, I'm kind of against the R trading, and you'll see why. But maybe this is a case where you could say, okay, well, I know my risks are defined to here, and I have a potential reward above that but what i do is i say okay entry minus stop that gives me the initial profit target you know all of that'll make sense as usual i'm getting ahead of myself initial profit target up here so let's see what happens it triggers it comes back in bit of a bummer but then as you can see over the next few days it does begin to take off and it does bang out that initial profit target now at that point we will bring our stop up to break even and then we are free rolling so to speak on the remainder of the position. I'm gonna drive this point home quite a bit in a few minutes. Now, let's take a look at a 15 minute bar and the initial profit target again is up here and it didn't do a whole lot in early trading during the day and then the thing starts to rally very nicely. So about this time, I put in a trailing stop for 65 cents and I made a post in the Facebook group to let everybody know that we're getting close to initial profit target. And when I was doing a screen capture tonight, I was pretty excited to see 15 comments were made by you guys on this. So I'm, I'm so proud of you guys in the Facebook group. I really am. And it, it makes me proud to be a part of it. And a lot of times I just, I just watch you guys. You're so good at what you're doing. But you get it, and I really appreciate that, and it, and it makes it warms my heart, makes me feel really good. I don't want to get all sappy on you, but you could see I said, okay, I'm trailing the stop intraday, and then you guys talk about where your stops are and how you're doing it, which I think is just absolutely awesome. And we can learn from each other, and we do learn from each other. So I decided that about 65 cents would be a good trailing stop. So instead of taking profits when it hits this green line here, okay, I just so it said, oh, this thing looks like it's really running today. I'm gonna put in a trailing stop about 65 cents below the market for half the shares and see if I could squeeze out a little more profits. And initially I wasn't so sure about that, but then the initial profit target was hit. And at that point in time, I decided, okay, instead of taking half of those shares, I'm gonna continue to trail. But now, since the initial profit target is not only hit, but exceeded, I'm gonna give it a little bit more breathing room, just like we would do on a daily position. So in a daily position, we're going for the swing trade. Once you get the swing trade off, we shift gears, we go into longer term trend following mode, and we begin to trail that stop more loosely. We let it widen out, often not by doing anything. In other words, we don't tighten it, stock goes up a point, we, let's just leave it where it is, let, let it widen out a little bit. So. This is what happened the rest of the day. So it continues to rally, feeling pretty good about my trail and stop. And at one point, and then it starts coming in a little bit, but then finally it begins to rally again nicely. And I got stopped out toward the end of the day. Remember these are 15 minutes bar. So about 15, 20 minutes before the close, I got knocked out of this one. Now, here's another thing. So this was our initial profit target. So we beat the system with the trailing stop, not by a whole lot, not enough to brag about. Let me tell you what I was hoping for. If this would have been some stodgy blue chip company or something, then maybe I would have been happy with the initial profit target or the trailing stop and say, oh, you know what? It's rallied enough. I think I might take partial profits. The other thing you can do is, okay, we're up around 17. We were looking for less than 16. I just squeezed another point on this saying, you know what? I think I'm going to take it. Say you've got a thousand shares on, 500 shares times a point. That's an extra $500 that you did not expect to make. And $500 in one day is a lot of money. So $125,000 a year, I think, if you want to, my math is correct. Multiply that times 252 thereabouts. $100 is 25 grand a year. And that's how I do the math in my head a day. 
But anyway, but in this particular case, with one of these crazy acquisition companies, I'm thinking, you know what? I'm willing to, especially since we're above the profit target, okay? I'm willing to forego one point of gains. And if this thing keeps rallying, I would open it up to maybe two or three points, believe it or not. And then exit half on the close. Just in case, the, just in case, the Reddit boys or whoever jump on this thing and it, it goes up 10 points. Then I then I squeeze 500 times 10 points. I think that's $5,000. Then I get an extra $5,000 on a trade. It can happen, okay? Not often, but it can happen. And I think it's important, as I'm going to drive the point home later in the presentation, to use these little tips and tricks to position yourself for potential unlimited gains. So let's see what happened here. Again, there's the parameters down there. We were looking for 1560 on that initial profit target. I got out on the close or shortly, I'm short. I got out shortly before the close, as I said earlier. 1593 was my fill. I think I have a screen capture in here somewhere. So there it is right there. So 1593, and I exited at 1542.19. I'm on central time. So that would be 342. Actually, that's recorded. This brokerage records it in Eastern time. So you could see four o'clock would be the close in this particular case. So 342 and change is when I exited this position. So 33 cents, not a whole lot, but better than the poke in the eye. I had on a thousand shares. So this shouldn't be $500. It should be five. Uh, this dollar sign shouldn't be here. So 500 shares. 33 cents, that's $165, okay? Better than a poke in the eye, math in my head, 37.5K extra a year, if you squeezed out that on, on every one of these trades that you make, round numbers, maybe a little bit better than that, maybe 40K. Now, I know that's kind of fuzzy math when you do this an annualization, but you know what would the world be without hypothetical questions? And that's right with a W. Anyway, long story endless, I was able to do this across multiple accounts. And so it begins to add up a little bit. And if you can make a little here, a little there, it does begin to add up in, over time. Now, Vizio, same sort of issue, nice little first deep retracement or first pullback. It's a, the first pullback, first deep retracement are kind of interchangeable. It's just the depth of the pullback. In this case, I consider it deep enough to consider a first deep retracement. In the service, I just call it the first pullback. Same thing. So it's, it's the same pattern, okay? One is just a little deeper than the other. And you can see the parameters are down there. So in entry here. Now, notice my entry is a little bit higher. And, and you know, the Italians, the Italian bank has gotten me thinking, maybe I do need to define these things a little bit better. Everybody here tonight, or most everybody here tonight, I think has been around for a while and we've kind of noodled with this money management. You've been through all the courses under the gold member section and you know all these things. And I got to realize that new people might not know all these things. But in this particular case, I didn't want to put the entry too close to the current price. Notice it was an inside day. So I look at like the last couple of highs and say, okay, last two highs and maybe a little wiggle room above that. In your mind's eye, kind of combine the bars, okay? So this, let's say this was one bar with a close here. Then up here would be a fairly liberal entry. You want an entry far enough away to not get triggered on noise alone, but not so far away that you miss the reversion to the mean move of the pullback. So the pullback market is oversold. We're looking for that reversion to the mean move in the direction of the trend. As I said a thousand times, Got into a debate with somebody. They called me a reversion to the mean trader. That's not a nice thing to call me. And we went back and forth a little bit because he was a reversion to the mean trader. And then finally he says, you're trading reversion to the mean in the direction of the trend. It's like, ah, oh, well, that's a fancy way of saying pullback. So yeah, I am trading reversion to the mean in the direction of the trend. I'm looking for a bounce back in the direction of the trend, but I'm not trying to catch that falling knife, okay? Now, initial profit target is up here. And that's one for one. And I just kind of want to set the stage for that because when we talk about money management in a minute, uh, specifically with the R, it's going to make a lot more sense. So entry minus stop is your risk. We take that risk, we broadcast it above the entry. So if that's two points, we're looking for two points above. In this case, we're looking for 3.5 points, okay? Doesn't look like that big of a range, but it is. And that's what the stock called for. 
because it had a pretty good run down from what 16 or 17 less than 17 maybe 16 all the way up to 26 or so that's a pretty good run in a stock percentage wise especially so you can see not a whole lot happened but it did trigger an entry and then it just kind of died out before it finally began to rally now, finally <laughs> if all of them hit the profit target within two weeks you'd never see my fat ass again but it did rally nicely and hit the ipt now so what we do of course is we trail a stop higher we trail a stop to break even when the when the ipt is hit in this case it really didn't move in our favor that much until like the last day or so before it hit the ipt so it wasn't really a whole lot to bump up and then the stop all of a sudden when we hit the ipt when i say all of a sudden meaning the moment we hit the ipt you bring your stop immediately to break even so you're free rolling on the rest of the position now in this case roughly 600 shares per 100k okay i think the muds was a thousand shares per 100k or thereabouts at least that's how i traded it so this is what happened intraday you can see once again just to remind you of those parameters entry protective stop ipt on the bottom 3.5 is the risk and 3.5 is the initial profit target so I actually missed this spike here. I went in the house for breakfast and a contractor called and my wife said, hey, is it okay to put your own speaker? And I'm like, yeah, whatever. And so before you know it, I come back to the office and I'm like, kind of like, um, kind of like Beaver, you know, I was like, oh geez. <laughs> I wish I could say that. Oh geez, golly, shocks. <laughs> Anyway, so I missed the IPT and I said, you know what, I'm just going to put in a trailing stop on that and let the chips fall where they may. And this is how it worked out. So we were looking for 27 and ended up with 26.95. So, eh, you know, I'll get over it. I'll live to fight another day. And then I exited, as you can see, market on close on the remainder. So you can see, look at that. It's, it's uh, four o'clock. It actually shows a little bit late because that's Sometimes these market on closes get reported a little late. I don't know exactly how they work. If somebody could, in the com if you're watching this on YouTube in the comments section, explain to me how a market on close works because I think that would be interesting to know. I think it's neat to know. I don't know if it's need to know. I just know that I put in my orders market on close and that way I don't have to watch this stock, especially if I have to get out of something else and manage some things going into close. All right, so that's how to squeeze out some additional profits on the swing trade portion of your trade now it's a little more work and then obviously you could lose a little money doing it and it causes more decisions and there's a lot of things going on but with the invention i should say of the for lack of a better word advent is that the word with the advent of automated trailing stops in stocks they've been having them forex forever but in stocks, they now have them, which is really, really, really cool. You could say, okay, I got my IPT. What if I just put in a trailing stop on the remainder and you know go about my life? And not today, because <laughs> today was kind of crazy, but a few days ago, I actually had in my initial trailing stop and I went for a bike ride with my wife. And it was very nice to actually get out and get some fresh air. Late in the day, about an hour ago, I received a private message. I was going back and forth with one of you guys. And he says, you know, I'm a money management junkie. Have you ever used or studied the value of our values? And what did I do with it? I think I put it back on the shelf. Oh, here it is. And he's referring to Van Thorpe's book. I don't know if you can see it or not. And I didn't have time to read what Mr. Thorpe wrote, but I do have strong opinions about the risk versus reward. So I think by next week, I'll reread what he wrote and, and see if I have to correct anything in this presentation. But I already know how I feel about the risk versus reward or our values, as Mr. Thorpe calls them. Keep in mind that I've tried everything in the world and i've got the scars to prove it <laughs> believe me okay i've lost a lot of money over the years trying everything in the world and i think you have to reach a point where you you, you become somewhat never complacent but somewhat happy 
and confident in what you're doing and then look to constantly improve it. Kind of a Kaizen approach to thing. Read the Kaizen way. I don't know if I have the book within reach with my little curtain here. You don't want to see what's behind the curtain. <laughs> I'm working around that, working in my office. But the Kaizen way is just small little tweaks and improvements, kind of like that squeezing out additional profits. And at the end of the year, at the end of two years, at the end of 30 years, it just gets better and better and better and better and better. And the point I'm trying to get to, and believe it or not, I have one, is that in trying everything under the sun, I know what works, what doesn't, and I know how markets really work from my perspective. Now, Mr. Thorpe or someone else, and again, I shouldn't criticize because I haven't read this book in a long time and I don't remember exactly how he talked about it. But a lot of these trading books talk about, oh, your reward has to be three times your risk. Okay, that's that sounds really good on paper. It makes a lot of sense. And I went in and tried to do a lot of that type of trading in the past. So he's saying, yes, for instance, if my risk is a hundred thousand dollars per trade, that is one R, right? So if I make say twenty five hundred, that's plus two R. Okay. So he went on to say, and this is one of you guys in the Facebook group. CJ and CJ went on to say you lose a thousand. Okay, so you're risking one and you can make two and a half. Well, that sounds great, right? So let's draw that out. So let's say you got a nice little pullback. Your entry's here, and your stop is down here, kind of like the examples we just saw, right? Okay. And we make that measurement, and that R is one. R for risk is one. R. Okay. So we broadcast that up, and this might not be to scale, but it looks about right. So let's say the we want to make 2.5 the R value. So the R is 2.5 to 1, okay, the R value. That sounds really great on paper. So I lose $1,000. Oh, man, that sucks. But, hey, I just made $2,500, and I'm making $2,500 every time I win. And I'm only losing $1,000 every time I lose, okay? Well, even if you're 50% correct, you would own the freaking world. <laughs> Believe me. I mean, think about that. And somebody might want to do the math on the fly. But what would you make, okay? Let's say you're 50% correct. So each trade would be, what would that be? Would be, uh, let's see, 12. Let me see if I can do it here. 2.5. Let's see, let's $2,500 minus $1,000, $1,500. So you would average $1,500 on every trade, okay? So you made 1,000 trades in a year. That's $1.5 million, if I did my math correct, okay? So that really sounds good on paper, <laughs> you know? Let's just risk a little, or risk one, and we're going to have a 2.5 reward. Well, that'd be fantastic. Well... I think the easiest way to explain why this doesn't work is statistically a 1x adverse move is 2.5 times more likely than a 2x move, okay? 2.5x move, that should read. And then to add insult to injury, plus 1x is not your max loss. And believe me, I've done all this. I've been there and I got the t-shirt, okay? Now, keep in mind, if you want to have an incredibly accurate system, okay, then what you do is you take profits at 1x and you risk 3x, okay? And that'll be the most profitable system in the world as far as percent correct, except that it will eventually blow up. So just the opposite doesn't work either. Now, before I digress too far, since the map is not the territory, right, okay, and what sounds good in a lot of these trading books, they all preach it in theory, okay, therefore, you really have to trade for unlimited gains, and that's the reason I put this in here, and I, I know I slipped in a few comments in between, imagine that. But the reason that I put you have to trade for limited gains is because your losses aren't always limited. And your losses won't always be normally distributed. You can get a string of losses 
and it gets pretty ugly pretty fast. As I think anyone here probably knows, it can get ugly really fast. Now, I believe in trading for limited gains, trade for limited gains on the first loaf, half of the position, like you saw earlier, the 500 out of 1,000 shares, and then try to squeeze a little bit more money out of that, so you're making a little bit more than one R on the first loaf, and then trade for many times that value on the second loaf. So we've got one in the portfolio right now, up 449%, but who's counting, right? So if we look at the R on that, okay, that's 20 times R. If we'd quit at 2.5 times R, we wouldn't have that $20,000 of open profit in the portfolio. We would have total, we'd have what, um, $2,500, I guess. Now, right before I went live, I thought it'd be kind of cool to calculate the pirates favorite value and that's the R value okay so as you can see on the CPE it's 20 and notice in all the whites where we take in where we take initial profit targets it's one or fairly close to one it approaches one or somewhere near one now in a case like mods and my spreadsheet right because I was able to squeeze out a tiny bit more profit, mine might be like 1.1 or 1.2. So if I could improve a little bit on that first loaf, on that one R, then I kind of beat the system through that little, that little Kaizen tweak, so to speak. But as you can see, around one for everything that's in white, that's our swing trade because we don't know if the stock is going to keep on moving in our favor. But through this money management, which is a simple, stupidest money management ever <laughs> you know but it works and it works really well and i've yet to find anything better and every now and then we'll noodle with some things in, in the facebook group see what we can come up with and then I, i'm pretty passionate about what i'm doing here and you know it's it's a little bit hard it's a little bit hard to you know change my mind but i'm willing to be open to additional things but just on the surface, something like the R value, which 2.5 to 1 sounds fantastic, right? Unfortunately, again, the map is not the territory. But you can see in our open positions, we've got a 4.63 R, hopefully in counting, the 20 R I'm bragging about, right? 5 R, 1.6 R so far on Zim, not really setting the world on fire just yet. 0.71 left on the Vizio, okay, but it's still possible. And now we're up to 1.48 on the mods. And then so far, we're only at 0.59 profit to risk on the Sky T, which triggered today. But hey, you know what? If I get that much in one day already, I'm pretty happy. So it's another one of those in theory and practice things. And Yogi Berra once said, in theory, practice and theory are the same. In practice, they are not. And if you've been trading for more than a day, I think you know that. So again, you must trade for unlimited gains with limited losses. Now, might be there might be an exception to the rule where the gains are somewhat limited. And you know, I'm talking about all these profit centers lately, and I've probably been trading for I guess 30 years now. I hate to even do the math anymore. I know I was in my early 20s when I first started. And uh, I remember placing an order at work, <laughs> and the the person in the office next to me is stuck her head in. She's like, "You're really doing this?" Because I th I thought you were just joking, like you're Mr. Wall Street or something, you know? It's like, no, I'm I'm actually trading. <laughs> Probably should have been doing more work than trading, but that's another story. I never said I was a good employee. <laughs> but anyway, one thing I was thinking about is that. With my methodology, like it's just said, I, I spent 30 years working on this thing, right? Whereas some of these profit centers, it might not have been as long. So maybe something like the R value is something I need to consider a little bit more for an intraday trade, okay? Or a day trade, if you want to call it that, where your gains are somewhat limited. I gave up about 75% of my profits today. I was up big earlier in the day, okay? 
And I, a little little voice inside of my head, it's like, Dave, you're you're rarely up that much first hour of trading. Why don't you just lock it in? And you know, you're trying to pay for some fun stuff around here, and you're trying to play a little game to see if you can do intraday trading and take half those profits and put it towards your little cash stash fund. I actually have a, a, a account I call cash stash, and I make a transfer on the profitable days at the end of every day. You know, that that profit would be pretty nice. Divide that in two. Still got a lot of money, but I hung in there and, and pushed for unlimited gains. And so did I do the right thing? Well, if you're looking at it from a results based standpoint, the answer is no. But maybe I could have by letting everything run for potential unlimited gains, okay? And I was to a point where, you know, God willing, but it was I was to a point where I shouldn't I should end the day profitable no matter, no matter what. So be willing to let it ride a little bit because I've had much much bigger gains than what I had. But you know, it's kind of like that old Jackie Mason, you know, mental masturbation in your head. You're going back and forth like should I do it, should I not? And that's where, by the way, not to to back into anything, not, not that I would do that and get it, go off on a tangent, but that's where you got to be really careful. And I'm I'm real cognizant of this lately because I am getting a little more active, maybe a little more active than I should with some of these profit centers. And that, all that takes a little energy. And it's like one thing I was, woke up thinking about this morning, which I thought I'd talk about tonight, is that you need to keep your eyes on the prize. And if you saw that portfolio and how fantastic that looks, and that one today up several thousand dollars, depending on the account size. And I'm trying to think of how much in what account, but it was a lot. Okay. And there have been times where I'm going in and doing a lot of these ancillary things. I'm like, hey, look at me. I just made $500 and blah, 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 you know? And then it's like, and then at the end of the day, I was like, I, I missed my own recommendation, you know? So you got to keep your eyes on the prize. But if you could squeeze out a little money here and there in these profit centers or doing these intraday trading, then that's great. So anyway, the point going back to the DR value is, and I've talked with one of you guys about this before too. And Mike, you're here tonight. We talked about you know, do you quit at a certain point of the day? Do you quit if you're down so much? So there's, I think there's a whole host of problems with the intraday trading that I might not have fully addressed. So what I'm saying is I don't know everything. In fact, come in every day into markets and you get humbled really quick. The moment you think you do, you get in a lot of trouble. So getting back to the to possibly intraday trading or very short-term gaining trading where your gains are limited and you you don't have the luxury of being well, willing to give up some of those gains. I was looking at some of my position stuff earlier today, and I you know I was thinking about some of the posts earlier this year and Facebook when we went through a little bit of a drawdown. It was more than a little bit of a drawdown, but luckily not a whole lot stopped out and everything just came flying back. And I was looking at the numbers today and I was amazed. And it was just a few weeks ago where things didn't look that good. Okay, so. If you're in that longer term trend following mode, you're willing to, and you have to be willing to, and it's painful, but you have to be willing to give up some of those profits, okay? Watch that R evaporate for the potential unlimited trades. But if it's shorter term, you sort of don't have that luxury, and I haven't completely wrapped my head around that. But even in short term trading, I still think longer term, the way to trade is to position yourself somehow for unlimited gains. Now, so day trading might be an exception, okay? I'm not fully of that belief, but maybe if you're doing some kind of S&G trading, like options trading, okay? Especially these, the gamma scalping type of thing, or in this case, it's not gamma scalping, but it's gamma that made this position work. But like today I came in and just for S&Gs, I said, well, let me price those UVXY shares. Because if this market tanks, and it looks like it was getting ready to tank, These things didn't go through the roof. And in my more active account, what I did was I actually traded some that were at the money. And then for S and G's in this this cash account, I'm like, you know, I could sweep this under the rug. Nobody's gonna be the wiser, right? And I bought 50 of these UVXY calls, which were which were slightly out of the money, for seven cents each. Okay. Now the maximum that I could ever lose on this trade tomorrow they expire tomorrow april 30th 2021 at three o'clock my time four o'clock eastern 
I will be out seven cents. Okay. Got 50 of them. But that means with 50 options, that's like buying 5,000 shares of the UVXY. And if the market really does crack, this is kind of a bit of a, a this is a this is an SAG trade, okay? This is a lottery ticket. So for $383, I bought a lottery ticket, okay? Tomorrow at four Eastern, it's either gonna be worth a lot of money or nothing. <laughs> so and fortunately today when the market began to tank a little bit, I said, you know what, Dave? Even though you initially thought you would just gonna sweep this on the rug, hang on to it, see if the market blows up overnight and cash out tomorrow sometime. You know, this thing is up at 16 cents, which is more than a double within a few hours. Why not go ahead and lock in half of those shares? So I sold 25 at 16. If you add all these up, it comes to 25. And you add all these numbers up, it actually comes to a little bit more than what I paid. So now I'm free rolling, and now I'm looking for 25 to 1 or 100 to 1 or 1,000 to 1, okay? It could happen. Probably won't. Okay. So maybe in S and G trading, you could say, okay, my the, mo the most I could ever lose is seven cents. If you take a position trade, the most you could ever lose is whatever you put up. Okay. So I was looking at some of these earlier. It's like uh, you might have to put up fifteen thousand or twenty thousand dollars on a hundred k account. I know that that math does get a little scary on some of these positions. And what you're hoping, and I know you should never use the word hope, but what you're hoping is that you're gonna get out at least half of that really soon. I'm always looking to take money off, always looking to take money off. And then when I think I have the mother ball opportunities, then I'm putting money back on. I'm not, I don't dislike cash. When I log in and see a big fat pile of cash in my account, as opposed to equity, I don't think FOMO, 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 I'm missing out, I'm missing out on something. I think, you know what, I got a lot of money and I can buy the next great stock or short the next, crappy stock you know so cash is okay i'm always looking to scale out in a case like this again I, I would love to just place the bet wait until tomorrow see what happens okay and it is a bet i use the word bet in this particular case because this is a little bit more dangerous trading but i did have a plan in place i was playing the opening gap reversal which i'll show you here in just one second and a few of the shares that i played today so maybe you can come up with some kind of r thing if you're trading long options or you're trading some wild and crazy options every morning i wake up i do morning pages and i'm about about eight months behind seven or eight months behind in reading what i wrote they tell you to do these things for it's uh julia cameron recommends it in a book called the artist way and i did them years ago before i ever heard of julia cameron and then i forgot about them and got busy and all it takes a lot of time but you write three handwritten pages every day anyway long story endless i went back about seven months and i was and this is what sort of prompted me to do this s and g type of trade the if i when i speak in person i'll often talk about a friend of mine an ex-friend of mine he's, he's a dead friend of mine <laughs> not that it's funny but uh anyway he his claim to fame was he turned five thousand dollars into roughly a million dollars i saw a statement about 975 or whatever don't quote me on that but i'm 99.9 .9 sure it was over a million at some point in time anyway he round tripped it showed up on my doorstep and it's, it's it goes on and on and on from there we uh, maybe we'll get around we have a retreat one day we'll tell some some jimmy stories <laughs> uh anyway long story endless once again but I went back and looked and eight months ago, I was like, you know, how did Jimmy do that? That would be fun to do that again. And, and the way Jimmy did it was he actually had a theme based investment, which I would say 999 of them out of a thousand don't work. It was today on, I, I never watched CNBC, but I wanted to have the ticker on in the house when I went to grab a little lunch around 1.30 or so. And they were showing the stock, they had a stock picking contest or whatever. And you know, these people are given all these reasons and all these themes, and it's like, you know, no, you don't, Danny. It, it doesn't necessarily work like that. But in this particular case, his theme did work. He he knew that the memory chip business was a commodity-based business, and he just started buying call options. And his first trade is funny as hell. He calls me up. I had a day job, and 
then and he said uh if i want a stock to go up do i buy a call or a put and i'm like buy a call jimmy and then hang up the phone and a few minutes later the phone rings and i answered he's like yeah and he's like uh my broker doesn't know whether i should be opening or closing the position i said you want to open it <laughs> so that gives you that just to show you how little he knew but what he did was he just kept parlaying those options and out the money options and out the money options and that'll work until they don't and if i'm able to succeed with this S and G type thing like this, and I don't recommend it highly, but if you're able to take a small amount, and I was talking with one of you guys about this with, with cryptocurrencies, especially if you're doing something crazy like reversion to mean trading, which will work until it don't, then maybe if you do, let's say, let's just to make the math easy, I, would, don't, I wouldn't risk $5,000 on an S and G thing, but let's just say you start with five and then you turn it to 10. Well, take five out and then you know double that again and just keep using, keep taking half out as you double it anyway i think where i was going with all this is is this morning i was thinking about it because i was reading those old notes about what jimmy did and i think it it sort of inspired me to look at something crazy like slightly out of the money vixie options which are just wild and crazy it's gambling okay but i but i figured 400 bucks who cares right anyway so at 16 cents, that's 2.28x, okay? So it's kind of close to that 2.5R number, okay? And I, by the way, anytime I put on options position, I always sell half at 100%. That's just my rule, and I think that's the best thing that you can do. And that way, you've got a free position, you're free rolling, and you go from there. So maybe some kind of S&G trading where you're trading long options that are kind of crazy, a gamma play or some way out of the money options or something where you have limited risk, you're not putting up a whole lot of money, then yeah, then that R thing might actually work. All right, let's talk about profit centers. Now, profit centers, as I've said recently, are ancillary to the core methodology, the real money in the core methodology. And again, We've got to remember to keep our eyes on the prize. We don't want to miss that SKYT. We don't want to miss that CPE trade that goes up nearly 500%. It was up 500% a few weeks ago, I think. And we don't want to miss those other big winners because we're messing around. Well, I've got to watch my language here. I don't want to demonetize my video. <laughs> but we're messing around with all these little things, okay? And picking up nickels. What's the old? Not picking up nickels in front of the bulldozer, but. Uh, chasing the nickels and, and overlooking the dollars. There's got to be a better way of saying these things. But you got to be careful with these profit centers, and I can't emphasize that enough. And then, again, the energy thing, it's like I'm pretty drained right now because I spent way too much time looking on the screen when I had deadlines to meet with all this other stuff going on with my business. But anyway, the intraday leverage shares, one thing that you could do with these guys is trade the opening gap reversals. Now, last week, I talked about the fact that if you're doing leveraged ETFs with relative strength and you want to be, let's say, in the top one to five ETFs all day long, okay, SOX S, SOX L, Lab U, Lab D, um, SQQQ, TQQQ, and Drip and Gush, and you, you know the uh, usual, usual suspects, Lab D, Lab U. You know, have those in your screen, on your screen, have them sorted by relative strength. Did the same thing with the Landry List for the Russian dolls, like we talked about last week. And you don't want to rush out and buy the number one or number two or number three or even number four or five, whatever that's on the list, unless you have like some sort of pattern or something. You want you got to be careful, like the Feng D did last week, as we talked about this. You had a gap higher and it stayed number one in the list for quite a while. Now Technically, you could have a gap and go, but you got to be careful not to get faked out, okay? Gap and go or no go like we talked about last week, and this thing came right back in. So buying the number one on the list would not have worked in this case. So you want to pay attention to make sure that that reason it's number one wasn't an overnight gap that you wouldn't have traded anyway, okay? Change from open is something I've been noodling with a little bit, FYI, and that's to help me get that delta relative strength we talked about last week. And I think there's definitely something to delta relative strength. Go in and watch last week's episode for a lot more on that. I don't want to go off on too much of a tangent there. 
But you can see, even though this thing was number one for quite a bit of the morning, okay, even up, up here, it was still up significantly overnight. It would have been a really bad trade just to buy the top relative strength. Now, we could use this to our advantage, okay? Notice again, today, like the thing you or whatever that was on the other screen, the market gapped open today, so all these inverted shares look pretty good. They were number one, TQQQ was number one, and SOXL, I think, was number one, and LabU was number one, and looked like it was going to be off to the races, but fortunately for us trader types, we were able to sit on our hands for the first 50 minutes just to see if it reversed. Now, again, sometimes you have to take the gap and go. But in this particular case, it did reverse fairly early, it began to implode. Now, the great thing about the market is we don't care which way it goes. So I was able to play the opposite shares, the SQQQ and some other ones. So SQQQ gaps down on the day. This is a 15 minute chart. So I was like, well, let's just put in a buy well above the open, go about my life, okay? IPT up here somewhere, about 50 cents higher. And it rallied up nicely, hit the IPT, and then it stopped out. Now, here's a case, like I said earlier, you can see this is one of many trades that I placed today on the short side, okay, short shares. And it stopped out because we had the big old market reversal. Now, I did try to get a little cute and played some long shares and made back a little bit of that. But if I had to quit at 10.45 or, or quit by noon or 11 o'clock my time, I would have had a much better day. So maybe there is a case for limited to your gains if you're day trading or something. I haven't fully wrapped my head around that. I still think you have to have unlimited gains. If you feel differently, leave me a comment below. Now, drip, this is a beautiful type of ogre setup. These are my favorites where they find their high fairly quickly and then begin to sell off a little bit. In that case, you're like, aha, I didn't get caught up in that initial fake out. And you gotta be careful because if you're staring at this little bar here, especially if you look at it like a five minute bar, and I learned my lesson with five minute bars, believe me. And like I said last week and week before, by accident, I went to 15 minute bars and then I've been in 15 minute bars ever since. And that's kept me out of a lot of trouble because if you're looking at five minute bars, this on a five minute bar just looks like it went to, it's gonna look like from here to here. And you're gonna be like, oh my God, I gotta get in, I gotta get in, gotta get in, gotta get in. Anybody ever bought the high ticket today? If you haven't, you're lying, right? We all have, and we all do. We all will continue to occasionally buy the high ticket of the day. It, it's spelled with silent SH happens. But in this case, I'm like, okay, be careful, Dave. First 15 minutes, don't get sucked in, don't get sucked in. If it truly is a, a, a gap and go, then I'm going to do it. But in this case, it was not, or opening gap reversal, I should say, in this case. So I was like, all right, well, let's just put a buy order in, go about my life, start working on these slides or whatever else I'm doing, watch some other markets. And you can see it rallies up, triggers, hits the IPT. And then in this particular case, I actually rode this all day long. Now, these are my ideal trades, okay? I want to ride them all day long. And see, this is a, a, a low energy trade. The only reason this is a high energy trade is if, if I make it a high energy trade, okay? Or, or, or energy consuming trade, or maybe we need to come up with some better terminology, some uh, like an inefficient trade, okay? And uh, I grabbed this book right before I went live because I talked about it in weeks prior, how to fail at almost everything and still went big, kind of story of my life, kind of story of my life. <laughs> So anyway, uh, that's Scott Adams, the creator of Dilbert. And in the book, he talks, so it's a good little book. It's a good read. Uh, it's kind of lighthearted, obviously, from, from the um, uh, a cartoonist, you know. Which, but anyway, he talks a lot about the management of energy. I probably need to reread it. And if if I'm if my goal is to go in and get that opening gap reversal, put in my limit order up here, my trailing stop down here after my buy order triggers, okay? And some of you guys are pretty smart and figured out methods to actually um, to do this a little bit better than what I'm doing. And I think one of you guys has an API and we were talking a while back and I think I wanna see how that develops and that could be kind of cool too. 
but this would be the best trade in the world and it's only it only takes as much energy as you want to put in it okay so all right i'm watching the first few minutes of trading app begins begins to implode i put in my buy order here go about my life zing i get triggered in i put an initial profit target the trailing stop there's nothing else to do in this trade except near the close i put in a market on close order okay so 99 percent of the day there was nothing to do now did i watch it of course am i interviewing myself yes <laughs> but this is the low energy type of trade and, and we're really no matter what you do in life you if you think about it and this is what douglas uh Scott Adams, not Douglas. Scott Adams really got me thinking about it. Is no matter what you do in life, it's a management of energy. Okay. And one of my friends, he's a client, and he was one of one of, and I don't I can't get into the details because I don't want anybody to get thrown off, but it but it was a friend of a let's just say a friend of a friend wronged someone. And he was very upset about that and it threw his whole day off and it was consuming his energy. And I'm like, do you think that friend of the friend is worried about you right now? And he's like, no, it's like, well, you know, <laughs> let it go. But you gotta be careful what consumes your energy, okay? Now I watch the screen too much, my shoulders are tight. You know, was was the money worth it? I don't know. You know, it's like, is it is it worth it with some of these profit centers? I don't know, and I'm working on it. I'm trying to figure it out. Socks S, same sort of thing, opening gap reversal. That's a little bit trickier one because that one looked like it was going to blow and go on that first bar. And that's where you got to sit and wait and wait and wait. I'm not saying wait 15 minutes because 10 minutes into the bar, you might have to take the trade. But when you go to place the order, one, one little trick that I do, not always, but most of the time, is... If I think it's a gap and go situation, or in this case, a reverse and go situation where it, it is a bona fide reversal and it is happening in early trading, I'll put in a stop order, okay, above the market, okay? So let's say that, let's say that this point here, I determine that, oh, this looks like a real reversal. Dang, I know I'm gonna get faked in or I could get faked in. Let me just put the order in a little bit higher and if I get triggered in, I get triggered in, okay? So imagine like this order was down there, down here somewhere. And I'm amazed, not all the time, because I, again, like I said earlier, sometimes I buy the high ticket of the day. But what amazes me is how many times just putting that order in an extra five cents or 10 cents above where the market is trading, I will miss that high ticket of the day. And I missed like three of them recently, within the last week to 10 days. And there was one that I got faked into, and I said, you know what? I was due. It's no big deal. But I'm amazed at how many times I would have been so inclined to go in a mark with a market order and instead put in that stop order just a little bit above the market. It doesn't have to be a lot if you truly want to be in the market, if you truly think it's a bona fide reversal. Then put it in just above where you would enter. Now, in this particular case, I said, okay, first 15 minutes. Okay, it came off a little bit in here. Let me go ahead and put a buy order in. IPT would be up here. And then it did trigger on the next bar. And then you can see I got stopped out. Once again, gave up quite a bit of open profits, okay? But I do believe, and this thing would have kept on running, kind of like the drip did a little bit. That was my biggest winner today, I think, was the drip. And then Soxess, I think, was the next one. Then I could have it could have turned into a really nice trade. So I do think that you need to have the unlimited gains, even if you're going to do day trades. And as far as profit centers, I think the opening gap reversals are worth it. One thing that I've noticed recently, notice that um, we get the live charts. I'm going to show you the volatility came way off in the S and P's, came back today, and that's why that Vixie thing worked. But the volatility came way off. So if you're going in and try to play that intraday relative strength, you're going to get chewed up, chewed up, chewed up. So you got to be really careful and kind of back off a little bit on that kind of trading. And I'm working on it, believe me. But as I've said a thousand times, if you can catch holy grail days, that would be the best day to trade. And op big opening gaps like we had today, that might be the best day to trade those ETFs and then sit on your hands the rest of the time. Or if you think the market is really compressed in volatility and really due to expand.
by the way, uh, I don't broadcast every day trade that I make, intraday trade. I try not to call it day trading because I want to be able to get in like that drip and just kind of try to forget about it all day long and then exit on the close. I'm here anyway, working on slides or doing whatever, talking with you guys, hanging out in the Facebook group. Might as well fire off a trade, right? But anything outside of the intraday trade, some of those we do talk about in Facebook, as you know, but anything outside that that I show you here, as it, especially as it pertains to the core methodology, and some IPOs, we talk about those quite often in the Facebook group. But I'll mention, I won't show you anything here. My goal, at least, is to not show you anything here that I haven't recommended and haven't taken myself, obviously. So just an FYI. But if you go to daylander.com slash archives, you can see the archives of trading service, and then I will update those tomorrow when I'm doing this video. This will remind me to update them so you'll get to see the one at least, let's see, uh, about a week or so ago, you'll see the VIX CO trade, VIX VZIO, and the MUDs trade there. All right, let's hop into the charts. You guys want to start asking about individual stop questions, uh, stocks, feel free to do so. And also, if you want to, if you have any questions on anything so far, and I feel I feel bad when I say, you know, <laughs> my ADD, I think I do a better, uh, bad enough job of my own <laughs> without any help, but... Uh, Feel free to ask any questions about anything. The uh, the amount of questions has really come off, and I think that's because we talk about everything so all day long at Facebook, and I think that's probably what's what's happening. So let me get the charts up and running, and again, start asking my individual question uh, stocks. And I want to show you a few things with the markets and sectors, and then we'll get to your stock picks. All right, let's take a look at the P's, S&P 500, all-time highs today. Now, this market was all over the place, and you just saw those charts, but let's take a look at the 15-minute charts. And, you know, it'd, be, it'd probably be cool to look at a five-minute chart, too. So where are we? Right here, okay? So that first, it found its high in its first 15 minutes and then imploded, okay? Now, there were opportunities on both sides of the markets today, but this was kind of a grueling market to trade. I like a one-way route type of market obviously if we just went down and end of the day here i would have done a lot better than all doing all that stupid trading that i did but you can see first 50 minutes it found its high now let me just show you something here one of you guys were bring brought up this you were very nice you made some comments i think it was craig and you talked about things you learned in the show well let's say you come in here you got a gap and all of a sudden you see this market going straight up on a five minute chart or even like a one minute chart you got to be really careful. You're liable to get sucked in to that. But if you are looking at a 15-minute chart, it gives you a little bit more perspective. And that doesn't mean, again, and I can't emphasize this enough, and then as many times as I say this, somebody's going to say, well, you said don't trade in the first 15 minutes. No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying be cautious trading in the first 15 minutes because that's when the fake outs happen, okay? There are certain pros that they have a certain trading system where they, you know, don't trade the first hour. That's amateur hour. It's like, well, you know, sometimes your biggest moves are going to happen in the first hour. So, you know, good for you, but you can't just have those hard and fast rules. Just like I can't define to a T, and this is where I'm having trouble working with this Italian bank for my presentations on exactly where the entry should go, exactly where the stop should go, and so on and so forth. I could show you where I put my stops, and then I could explain to you how I came up with that reasoning. But as far as giving you a formula like ATR or something, a nice little package, it just doesn't work that way. And markets just don't work that way. Anyway, before I digress any further, imagine that. <laughs> so we actually made an outside day up in the P's, which is kind of interesting. The spiders look a little different. I, as you know, I'm not a big candle guy, uh, but there's some sort of candly looking pattern here. If somebody knows what that is so it's an outside day with this little this little hammer thing or whatever they call it tail down so let me know if that's something significant in candles you know my problem with candles is often say it's it's always a pattern you know it's three birds crapping on a wire or a, a pregnant sumo wrestler holding a little baby or whatever i don't know it's always something Anyway, you can see the gap higher, a little bit more obvious in the spiders, quite a, quite a bit of a sell-off, and then recovering to close well. I, I think that's a good thing. I think the candle people have a problem with that pattern. 
I, I hope they're right because I have some uh, I have some Vixie options. <laughs> I cashed out of them in my super active account, but I left those 25 on for S and G's just to kind of complete the the trade. By the way, if you go into a trade, what's your thought process? Okay, what's your plan? And my plan with that one was to sweep the money under the rug, and if it didn't work, and just not worry about it and hang on just in case it does. But the trader in me wouldn't, couldn't let that 100% gain, even though it's only you know, 400 bucks, whatever, evaporate. So I went ahead and took half. NASDAQ looks a little bit uglier than the P's. You can see we got an outside day down there. And that's why those SQQQs worked out so nicely. Sox S worked out nicely. Uh, Drip worked out nicely today, too, even though Drip can be non correlated to the overall market. But anyway, it did work out nice today. You can see nice gap higher, nice sell off, outside day down, not the end of the world. If we close down here, I'd be a little bit more concerned. So this market does seem to have some hidden buying that seems to come in, okay? What did Hagger used to call it? The plunge protection teams? I wonder if those guys are still around. They might be, you know? Who knows? Rusty looks kind of ugly. Big opening gap reversal there. Pretty serious sell off. Probably the SRTY. I need to see if I made any SRTY trades today. I think I bought a little URTY late in the day, but it didn't work out. But you can see outside date down there, and it's kind of mostly sideways, kind of head and shoulderly looking. The problem with something like a head and shoulder is it could it could take a, it could take three weeks to develop, four weeks to develop, a month to develop. It could just be a long drawn out topping process. You can't really time off of it. Now, if you get a head and shoulder with a bow tie or something like that then you've got some, okay? Let's take a look at the energies. Energy is a bit of an opening gap reversal there. Like I said earlier, you can see drip worked out nicely today, okay? And But the energy has kind of been stuck in the sideways range. They're trying to rally. We got to watch the prior highs in here to make sure they make it at least there and beyond, or ideally way beyond the highs. Now, let's take a look at the metals and I'll show you show you what's what's helping these commodities. Metals and mining sold off a little bit, but as you can see, it's had a pretty good run as of late. So I I wouldn't call them down and out just yet. In fact, they could actually use a little bit more of a pullback. So in case you're wondering what's happening with commodities, dollar has been headed lower. That's what makes the crypto work out so well too, by the way. But commodities are dollar denominated. And there's been talk before about changing currencies, if they ever make them euro denominated, at least while the dollar, you know, while the dollar's not so doing good, we'd have some uh, be very interesting. But right now, this is causing commodity prices to rise because it takes more and more dollars. It's just math. I'm not playing a theme here or nothing, right? Okay. It's just math. If if dollar goes down, it's to take more and more dollars to buy. I know the Aussie dollar, there's been some uh, weak, I think there was some weakness there or something, and, and Laurent, who's here tonight, is is saying that my service is very expensive. I think it's very reasonable, but if you pay it in Aussie dollars, it's a lot more expensive. Anyway, before I digress too far, imagine that. Gold has actually been improving as of late. It's been a little wide and loose for a while, but as you can see, it's begun to work its way higher. And it's starting to look pretty good. It's a little cup and handily, but it's at high levels. Okay, I, I like a cup. I see a lot of people draw cup and handles at high levels, and I used to do that back in the 90s. But everything worked in the 90s, right? But it, it has kind of bottomed out, and at the least, your bow tie moving averages are in uptrend proper order. I don't know if I'd rush out and buy gold stocks, but it is kind of set up in here, and it looks okay. Okay. Now me, I would prefer something that looks like this, like metals overall, as opposed to the gold and silver stocks. But maybe, just maybe gold and silver, or gold especially, not so much silver. Silver's just kind of a mess, as you can see. We'll bring up the real. Let's take a look at silver, the commodity. Silver, the commodity actually looks better than silver stocks, and that's a little unusual. But you can see silver's kind of improving in here, so we'll have to pay attention to what happens with the underlying commodity. Gold, looks a little bit like the stocks themselves and gold the commodity that is a little bit deeper bottom than the stock so we're making one year plus bottom so that's okay but you know me something like a commodity i like these four or five or ten year lows like we had here and then way back here 
and then look for those transitional setups like a bow tie, okay? And you could see, wouldn't we have one in 2016? That was a major, major low. And then we had one back in what, 2011, 2012, major, major top. And by the way, this is kind of interesting. I'm just seeing this. And this is a great thing about doing a show. We kind of have a bow tie down that's working here in the gold uh, commodity. So that's kind of interesting. But don't worry. If the dollar keeps dropping, gold will have its day. Gold will shine. <laughs> I'm kind of a closet silver fan because silver gets used up. And I think it was um, Doug Newberry used to talk about that a lot. With, And I think he's a bit of a hoarder when it comes to, not a hoarder. <laughs> I guess I'm a hoarder. If you, if you saw my garage and all the tools and crap I have. Um, what do they call those people? Prepper. He's a prepper. I hope he's not watching because he's probably nice and neat. <laughs> it's probably like, what'd you call me? Um, anyway, he would make the case that silver gets used up and silver does get used up. I think the reason I'm thinking hoarding is gold is hoarded, okay, as a store of value, as a precious metal, but very little gold gets used up. I mean, I'm sure there's some applications that, that gold's probably the best metal to use. But an electric car, a shit ton of silver goes into an electric car. Okay. Let's take a look at buy. Let's take a look at drugs while we're here. You can see drugs have been improving as of late. Today, now we're standing off their worst levels, but a little bit of a, a pullback today, a little sell off here. They're looking pretty good, but for me to get excited, I like to see them make new highs and beyond. It doesn't mean that if I saw a setup I really liked, that I wouldn't take it. I just would prefer the sector to be doing a little bit better. And biotech looks a little bit worse. We're kind of back in the soup here, just kind of trading sideways. In general, it's improved a little bit as of late. One or two big up days would get us out of this range. That'd be great. Unfortunately, one or two big down days would push us below the range. So we need to pay attention to that. A lot of areas looking okay, though. Retail, you can see just shy of all-time highs in here. Really had a very shallow pullback in the last little pullback. Trannies actually banged out new highs today with a little bit of vigor, at least for the trannies. Software looks okay, kind of a double top knockout look. That's kind of a bullish looking pattern. Now, if it doesn't trigger the knockout, like up here, it doesn't trade up here and it keeps dropping, then it's no longer bullish. But going into tomorrow, software looks pretty good. Semiconductors, kind of hard to get excited about semiconductors. As you can see, they kind of banged against the recent top in here. And they've lost some steam as of late. And if you don't believe me that they lost steam, okay, where were they back in February? And where are they now? They're a percent and change lower than where they were in February, okay? So kind of sideways. Yeah, they improved quite a bit, but then they got thwarted at their prior high in here. So We'll have to wait and see what happens there. Telecom and internet, some of these areas, I guess internet's like Amazon or something or whatever, but they're banging out new highs. And so as you go through sectors, you'll see some are at or near new highs. And there's a few that are a little questionable in here or a little sideways, but for the most part, sector action looks pretty good. A lot better than it did a week or so ago. And that's why, again, we take things one day at a time. All right, any questions on anything? So far, any individual stocks you guys want to talk about? I know we've been covering a lot of them in Facebook. Any any leftovers? Anything else? Any burning questions? <laughs> Quite a bunch tonight. RRD, here we go. For Chris. Hey, Chris. Okay. Yeah, that looks pretty good. And I think I had this one. No, I didn't. Okay. I thought I had this one on my landry list, but I didn't. And what what I don't initially I said looked pretty good, but I didn't notice that you had a gap here. Okay. And then it pulled all the way back into its prior base. So you want, it's okay to trade this. Let's say if you didn't have this gap here and it pulled back and it almost touched the base, then an entry above this high would have been the way to go. But now we've retraced 100% into the base and you've got a gap there. So it's got a few little problems. It, it does, and that's probably initially why I thought or initially I was bullish looking at this because it just kind of jumped out at me like, oh, that looks pretty good. But then I began to kind of pick it apart a little bit. The gap and the fact that it came all the way back in, I would pass on that one. Now, by the way, there's not a whole lot of setups out there. I think the Landry list had three or four stocks. I think it was one night I published it with zero, but that's the, that's the fewest I ever remember. But 
three or four is 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 very odd. And then if this market starts pulling back, I might have 20 stocks on that list. And I know that's kind of hard to manage when it gets that big, but I want to get them all on my radar and then I want to whittle them down from there. All right, any any more questions? Any other stocks? Going once, going twice. Y'all always do one right before I say it three times. <laughs> All right, uh, looks like uh, looks like we're done. I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. If you're not in the Facebook group, daviddavelander.com. If you're in the Facebook group, put a question in there so I can answer it for everyone. If something you want to keep private, you can PM me or DM, whatever they call it nowadays, and then I will cut and paste your question to the group, but I won't, I'll cut your name out of it. All right, everybody have a great night. If we don't talk to you now and then, everybody have a great weekend. Thank you so much. And may the trend be with you.